One of the coolest things you can do with a computer is simulate physics. From realistic video games, to the car industry, to that one aerodynamics of a cow meme I see sometimes, physics sims are a huge part of modern computing. Over the last few years, I've received hundreds of comments asking me to make one with redstone, and last month, I finally gave in. I went down a super interesting rabbit hole and ended up making what is now one of my favorite redstone builds ever. I hope you enjoy. The first digital physics sims were created in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Computers were starting to get more powerful, so scientists began simulating nearly everything. Astrophysical interactions, molecular dynamics, nuclear bombs, you name it. Then when video games took off a decade later, it just got even crazier. We went from just bouncing a ball, to fighting with sprites, all the way to now with realistic 3D interactions in nearly every new game. But when it comes to physics sims made in Minecraft, there hasn't been this same progress. Redstone is extremely slow, and once you reach a certain amount of complexity, it becomes impossible to run. So when I started thinking about what kind of physics sim to make, I decided that for once in my life, I didn't want to go down the super complicated route. Instead, I just wanted to find an idea that was simple, yet still visually impressive. That's when I found the wonderful world of powder simulations. A powder simulation typically has a grid of cells, and you can place different kinds of materials inside of them. As the simulation runs, gravity makes the materials fall, and they interact with the world in various ways. Materials like sand will form piles, whereas materials like water will flow out like a liquid. Typically, there are interactions between materials too. Maybe sand that touches water becomes mud, or maybe there's a lava material that turns water into stone. The possibilities are basically endless. You can have any interactions and really any materials you want. Powder simulations caught my eye because even though they look complex, the logic behind them is kind of simplistic. For example, let's say you just want to simulate sand. One way you could do that is by having every sand particle follow these simple rules. If the cell below me is empty, move down. Otherwise, if that cell already has sand, move diagonally, down into the left. If that cell also already has sand, move diagonally to the right. And if all three have sand, do nothing. With just these rules, sand particles already behave like a powder, bouncing off each other and naturally forming piles. The piles are always perfect pyramids, which I guess is not super realistic, but for such simple rules, it's still very impressive. My first goal was simple. I wanted to build a simulator for sand with just these four basic rules. If I could do that, I'd feel way more comfortable moving on to a more complicated powder sim. So the first step was to figure out how to move the particles. Typically when I hear movement, I think of shift registers, which use locked repeaters to move signals. These felt like a good idea because if you make them vertical, they can shift whole columns of particles down at once. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized shift registers are not a great fit here. The main idea of a powder simulation is that every cell thinks for itself. Some particles might be moving down, but at the same time, others might be moving diagonally. So instead of shift registers, I needed a more general movement system, something where all particles could be moved independently. As I spent the next few hours trying to make this general system, it was proving to be a struggle. I had a few promising ideas for the design, but they just all felt overcomplicated. Intuitively, I felt like there had to be a better way. So I decided to search YouTube to see if anyone else has made this before. That's when I found this video by Bratwurst. He also made a redstone sand simulator, just with slightly different rules. I looked at his movement system, and my intuition was proven right. There is in fact a much better way to do this using copper bulbs. You see, whenever sand moves, one cell turns off and one cell turns on. That is always the case. Copper bulbs toggle themselves whenever they're powered, off to on or on to off. So if you use a copper bulb to represent each cell, then all you have to do to move a particle is power the start and power the end. This will always work, as long as the start has a particle and the end doesn't. After learning this, I immediately went back to my world and spent the next couple hours building a new movement system with copper bulbs. It had three sets of wires, one for each kind of movement a sand particle can do. This first set is for moving down, so if I power here for example, you can see it moves the sand down. And the other two sets are for the diagonals, one for the left diagonal and one for the right. I should also mention that during this time, I reached out to Bratwurst to ask a few more questions about his build. He was incredibly helpful and even gave me tips for the structure of this video, so huge thank you if you're watching this. Now for the fun part, the actual logic. Remember, these are the rules for the particles. First, try to go down. Otherwise, try to go diagonal left. Otherwise, try to go diagonal right. This actually reminded me of a circuit I've made before, called a priority encoder. A priority encoder takes in any combination of signals and outputs the signal furthest to the left. If all the inputs are on, it outputs the left one. But if only these are on, it outputs the middle one, because now that's the leftmost signal. The reason I was reminded of this is because the rules also follow a priority. Out of the available options, down has the highest priority, then diagonal left, then diagonal right. 
So if you just tell the priority encoder which cells are available in the correct order, it'll output which way you should move. If all three are available, it'll say to move down. If it's just left and right, move left. If it's just right, move right. And if none are available, don't move. So over the next day, I just put this circuit onto every cell. It definitely should not have taken me an entire day, but for some reason I became obsessed with making it as small as possible. I ended up making it 4x4 blocks per cell, which I'm very proud of. Once that was done, the build was basically finished. The only problem was that it was getting hard to see the copper bulbs with all this wiring. So I quickly made a screen to just mirror the states of the bulbs with lamps. And while I was at it, I put a note block in the middle of every cell so that you can toggle them really easily. All that was left to do now was test it. I started dropping sand from the top, and it piled up exactly how it should. I cannot tell you how cool it felt to literally right click the screen and watch your particle join the pile. Now that I got my feet wet, it was time to go all out and make a fully fledged powder simulation. Like I said earlier, powder sims can have countless different materials, so step one was to figure out which ones I wanted in mine. After doing some research, I eventually landed on these four. Metal, stone, sand, and water. Metal has no rules. When you place it, it just stays in the same spot. This makes it useful for floating structures like platforms or ramps. Stone has one rule, move down if you can. This makes it always fall straight down like a heavy solid. Sand adds two more rules. After trying to move down, try to move diagonal left and then diagonal right. And water adds two more rules on top of that. After trying to move down, diagonal left and diagonal right, try to move straight left and then straight right. This makes it flatten out as evenly as possible, just like a liquid. Of course, there are many more materials I could have included, but I was happy with just these four. They bring lots of different properties to the table, and the way their rules build on each other gave me hope for a very elegant redstone circuit. I really wanted to use copper bulbs again, but sadly, I couldn't. They worked last time because I only needed two states, sand or not sand. This time, I needed five states, so I decided to use redstone signal strength instead. Zero represents no material, and one through four represent metal, stone, sand, and water. Then I made a texture pack to add a colored face to every cell. That way zero shows up as black, and cells with one through four show up as these four colors for the four materials. After that was the movement system. Last time I had three layers of wires for the three types of movement. This time I had five layers, because out of all my materials, there are five unique ways they can move. Only water can actually move all five directions, but because water can be anywhere, every cell needs it. Once that was built, I spent the entire next day debugging and testing. I did not want to have an issue with this later on, so I went until I was completely sure that any move with any material works perfectly. Then came the logic. Last time there was just sand, so all the logic was just a priority encoder to pick the highest option. This time there are four materials, so you would think the logic needs four different priority encoders, but that's actually not the case. Since the rules build on each other, you can actually use the same encoder for everything, as long as you add a small modification. To show you what I mean, here I have a single cell and a priority encoder for the five different kinds of movement. If the cell happens to be water, notice that the priority encoder already works perfectly. You can put in any available moves, like maybe diagonal left and straight right, and it'll output the highest option. But if the cell is something else, like sand, there's a problem. Unlike water, sand can't move straight left or straight right, which means that the two outputs to move those ways are no longer valid. So to fix this, just block these outputs whenever the cell is sand. Now the only working outputs are the correct ones, down, diagonal left, and diagonal right. In a similar fashion, when the cell has stone, all you have to do is block these four outputs. That way the only working output for stone is the correct one, down. And if the cell has metal, you can of course block all five, because there are no correct outputs for metal. Metal should never move. So yeah, this is now all the logic you need. Once I was certain of this, I went ahead and fit it into every cell. Thankfully, I wasn't concerned with how small I could make it this time, otherwise I could have easily spent a week on it. Instead, I just locked in, and after less than a day, all four materials were working perfectly. At this point, it's safe to say that I built a redstone powder simulation, but I still didn't really have any interactions. All the materials just rammed into each other. So I started thinking about which interactions to include, only to find out that there was a huge problem. Based on the way I designed this, adding pretty much any interactions would require a complete rebuild. So instead, I decided to settle for a different but equally cool new feature, eye tracking. If you've watched my previous video on chess, you've seen that there's some new technology that literally lets you use your eyes as a cursor. This is perfect for a powder simulation, because it would allow you to naturally draw materials as if you had a mouse. So I copied the breeze cage over from the chest build, I made a brand new detector panel, and now I could draw with materials just like on a real powder sim, and I officially called the build finished.
Powder simulations are a classic way of simulating physics, but there's obviously a lot more stuff out there. So if you're interested in more physics material, you should check out Brilliant, the sponsor of today's video. Brilliant is a website with thousands of lessons on not just physics, but many areas of engineering. I personally like their lessons more than other websites because they make a big effort to include as many visuals and interactive activities as possible. It makes me feel like I actually took something away from them instead of just memorizing information. I also really like how they've structured their courses. They always lay it out so that you learn the fundamentals first before leveling up to more challenging problems. A great example of this is their course called Digital Circuits. It starts with individual logic aids and naturally builds up to create more and more complex circuits, a strategy I've literally used before in my own Redstone tutorial series. To learn for free on Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash mapbatwings, scan the QR code on screen, or click the link in the description. Brilliant's also giving you guys 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant.